Next on Currents News, the Cuomo administration releases more data on nursing home deaths due to COVID, but one government watchdog group says it isn't enough. A key member joins us to talk about why. It's Catholic Schools Week and we're kicking it off with some coding kids who are helping shape a future in high tech. Then Pope Francis makes history appointing women to high level positions of power at the Vatican. And it's a full week inside the Beltway as lawmakers take on the stimulus bill in the impeachment trial. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Emily Druby. In today for Christine Persichetti. The controversy continues over the number of COVID deaths in New York nursing homes. State officials releasing new totals this weekend, upping the death toll at adult care facilities by more than 1,500. The information part of an ongoing battle between the state, a government watchdog group, and some lawmakers. 1,516. That's how many COVID deaths have been added onto the count for New York State adult care facilities. Raising the state's death tally at elderly care facilities, including nursing homes, to about 15,000. But the number of deaths isn't new. They were just attributed to hospitals before. The new totals released this weekend coming from a battle for transparency started by a think tank on behalf of family members demanding more accurate accounting. Over the summer, there was talk the number of nursing home deaths attributed to COVID-19 could be much higher than the state was reporting. That's because people in elderly care facilities who died in hospitals were not being counted. In August, the Empire Center for Public Policy decided to look into the claims, submitting a Freedom of Information Law request, or FOIL to the state for more numbers. A FOIL is basically a request for data that the government has to answer, except in rare cases such as classified defense information. Anyone can file one. After seeing long delays in the requested information, Empire Center filed a lawsuit along with State Senator Jim Tedesco. Still, the state continued to delay, setting a release date for the end of March. Reporting the number of deaths is always the hardest number to report out there, and we wanted to be sure uh, that the, those numbers were accurate. Some of the requested info was released after a scathing report by the state's attorney general. However, the FOIL hasn't been entirely fulfilled. According to the center, they are still waiting for a breakdown of daily deaths, hoping to use this information to take a deeper look at the impact of a highly criticized early pandemic decision by the Cuomo administration to force nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients, as we've reported on this in the past. Numerous mistakes made and bad policy decisions that were made that directly resulted in the deaths of thousands of New Yorkers who didn't have to die. And then the governor tried to cover that up. Just last week, a judge gave the Cuomo administration five days to release all the information that the Empire Center for Public Policy requested. That deadline is Wednesday. A little later on in this newscast, we will dig even deeper into the importance of this suit with their senior fellow for health policy, Bill Hammond. That's coming up in just a bit. While the governor is under fire for some COVID protocols, there is some good news for New York City restaurants. Indoor dining will resume in the Big Apple earlier than previously announced. Cuomo had originally planned to allow dining rooms to open up on Valentine's Day, but that date has now been moved up to this Friday. Welcoming news considering the frigid temperatures, indoor dining in the city has been shut down since December. The pandemic has also impacted Catholic schools across the country. A new report showing enrollment down by more than 6%. The single largest drop in almost 50 years. That downturn represents 111,000 students from the previous year. Elementary enrollment was down just over 8%, while secondary schools showed the least decline at 2.5%. The sharpest decline was for pre-kindergarten enrollment, down 26.6%. While some Catholic schools continue to struggle, the Diocese of Brooklyn is highlighting efforts in education during this year's Catholic Schools Week. Students at one Bushwick Catholic school are coding their way into the future. Experts say it helps with everything from creativity and math to communication and confidence. They're like a, a prize at the end. Most kids play games. Ellie Perez builds them. 
I'm proud of it. I like to see people enjoy the game that I make. From rescuing gifts from the Grinch, to escaping a timed maze, Ellie thought up, designed, drew out, and coded these games into existence. I feel like through my coding, I could like express myself, like my creativity, and um, it just helps me like relax. Ellie learned how to do this at St. Bridget St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Academy in Bushwick, and she's not the only one. The idea came from math and technology teacher Jose Martinez. He wanted to bring coding to the school, but he knew he needed to find a way to make it interesting to his young students. I know they play games. I thought that making games is something that could really get them excited. For years, educators have pushed to teach coding in schools, saying it improves problem solving and logical thinking. It has become an important skill in the job market, and it pays. One study found jobs that use coding skills pay an average of $22,000 more a year. Nonprofit Code.org says while 90% of parents want their kids to study computer science, only about 47% of high schools actually teach it, putting St. Bridget, a nursery through 8th grade school, ahead of the curve. Well, I'm thinking about their future, so I want them to get the most out of the school that they can get. Yeah, and I want them to have good memories. I want them to remember, you know, the fun they had here. Through this problem, students not only build the games, but publish them for anyone to play. The code is even made public, helping other students learn. Ellie will continue coding, now a beloved hobby, and Jose says he plans to grow the program next year. Both Currents News and the Tablet will continue to bring you full coverage of Catholic Schools Week. Be sure to check out CurrentsNY.tv and thetablet.org as we highlight the spiritual and academic benefits of a Catholic education. And remember to pick up the February 6th edition of the Tablet because it features a special insert with information about each school from academies to high schools and colleges in the Diocese of Brooklyn. In Washington, lawyers for former President Donald Trump are preparing his defense as the Senate gears up for his impeachment trial Tuesday. In a legal brief submitted on Monday, Trump's lawyers argue that he did not encourage violence, saying demonstrators should march over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard, and that his commitment comments ahead of the assault at the Capitol were protected under the First Amendment. They also contend that a former president cannot be tried under impeachment impeachment articles. Trump's legal team is calling his upcoming impeachment trial political theater, but impeachment managers in the Senate disagree. This as the House continues to hammer out a deal on a stimulus relief package. Nadia Romero is in Washington with the latest. On the eve of Donald Trump's second Senate trial, House impeachment managers say the former president incited violence with his rhetoric. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Trump lawyers laid out their case in a pretrial brief Monday. They say the impeachment itself is unconstitutional and simply an act of political theater. It's just partisan politics under a different name. As the impeachment process plays out in the Senate, the House is working on COVID relief legislation. But Democrats are divided over whether to include an increase to the minimum wage. If you look at who has kept us together these last almost a year now since COVID hit, it's people we haven't thought were worth paying. $15 an hour. We need to pay people what their worth is. President Joe Biden doesn't think the progressive proposal will make it into the final package. My right. guess is it will not be in it. Another sticking point, stimulus checks. Moderates want to lower the income threshold and give the full amount to people who make $50,000 a year or less. Families making $275,000, $300,000 a year may not be the most in need of checks at this point. From a political point of view, a little bit absurd, that you would have under Trump these folks getting the benefit, but under Biden, who is fighting hard for the working class of this country, they would not get that full benefit. But congressional Democrats do agree on a tax credit to give some families at least $3,000 per child. In Washington, Nadia Romero, Currents News. It was a big weekend for women in the Catholic Church as the Pope made two historic appointments. First, the Holy Father appointing Katia Samaria to be the new public prosecutor for the Vatican City State's Court of Appeals. This means that Samaria will be making a case for a criminal charge in front of the justices of the Vatican Tribunal whenever a conviction comes up for appeal. 
Pope Francis also appointed Sister Natalie Bacart as an undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops, meaning the nun will have a right to vote on church matters at the meeting. And tomorrow on Currents News, Crux Editor-in-Chief John Allen will be joining us, offering an in-depth analysis on what this could mean for the future of women in the Catholic Church. That's tomorrow on Currents News. More news out of the Vatican. Pope Francis' schedule has now been released for his apostolic visit to Iraq. The trip from March 5th to the 8th will be an opportunity to build dialogue between the different religious communities in the region. The Pope will meet with the leader of Iraq's Shiite Muslim majority and plans to hold an interreligious meeting at the Plain of Ur. The Pope will also pay a visit to the city of Karakush, which was home to Iraq's largest Christian community before it was raided by ISIS in 2014. There he will visit a cathedral that was burned by the Islamic State. In the meantime, the Pope as has returned to the public eye and is praying for the people of Myanmar. Prego affinché quanti hanno responsabilità nel paese si mettano con sincera disponibilità al servizio del bene comune. After seven weeks of live streaming his weekly Angelus from inside the Apostolic Palace due to pandemic restrictions, Pope Francis returned to his window overlooking St. Peter's Square to voice his concerns over the instability in Myanmar. Tens of thousands of people rallied on Sunday against last week's military coup, protesters demanding the release of their elected leader. There's a lot more news headed your way. After the break, we're heading to the West Coast, where parishioners are thrilled to be heading back inside for mass after the Supreme Court lifted a state ban. Plus, it's heartbreaking, it's bitter, it's America. The coronavirus disproportionately impacting the black community, how one company is battling the health care inequities that continue to persist in America. And Catholic doctors dedicated to helping some of, the, of New York's most needy communities. Stay with us. Starting February 15th, changes are coming to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. This Black History Month, we are remembering the trials and triumphs of the black community during this historic and tumultuous time. As the pandemic disproportionately affects communities of color, a past filled with deception and inequities is fueling their skepticism of the COVID-19 vaccine. Currents News, Jessica Easthope has more. A global pandemic, COVID-19 killing the father and grandfather of Detroit's Keith Gambrell. It's very frustrating. It's heartbreaking, it's bitter, it's America. The virus disproportionately impacting the black community, highlighting longstanding inequities in health care. The CDC reports black Americans are dying at three times the rate of white Americans. In response, Thermo Fisher Scientific, a science equipment company, pledged $15 million for tests and equipment to historically black colleges and universities in August. This has gotten, you know, black and brown researchers excited. This is, this is why we do what we do. The community that's given me so much growing up, it's really nice to be able to see um, more uh, testing efforts being brought to D.C. Then came the COVID-19 vaccines. Some black people hesitant to get the shot. We know that lack of trust is a major cause for reluctance, especially in communities of color. And that lack of trust is not without good reason, as the Tuskegee studies occurred within many of our own lifetimes. While battling a new pandemic, an old foe reared its ugly head again. Racism. Several states have now declared racism a public health emergency, acknowledging a painful past for black Americans that's still felt in present day. When I say George, you say Floyd. George, Floyd. George, Floyd. People spilling into the streets, demanding an end to police brutality and racial inequality. No justice, no peace. Channeling the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Big companies like Google and Yelp stepped up. Perfect timing for black business owners shutting down in numbers twice as large as others during the pandemic, according to a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And in Mississippi, a nearly 40-year fight finally won to replace the Confederate-themed state flag. Black folk in this state are very proud. And young folk 
young black folk don't have this flag to look to the rest of their lives. In Georgia, electing its first black U.S. senator. And nationally, a glass ceiling breaking. I Kamala Davy Harris, solemnly swear. The first woman and person of color as vice president. Another historic moment to add to the long list of accomplishments celebrated during Black History Month. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Tomorrow we'll explore some of the historical reasons behind the black community's hesitancy to get the vaccine. Historically, they have been vulnerable and um, taken advantage of um, in research and in science. How the shameful and unethical study known as the Tuskegee experiment helped fuel today's skepticism. It's an important story you don't want to miss. Now back to our big story tonight, nursing home deaths in the Cuomo administration. Bill Hammond from the Empire Center, a government watchdog group, was the driving force behind the lawsuit that put the count under the microscope. He joins us now. Bill. Hi, Emily. Bill, it's a grim picture, but you say the information put out by the Department of Health this weekend is just a small fraction of what was actually requested by your organization. Now, what exactly are you looking for and how will it help? Well, what we asked for is more or less all of the data that the state has relating to coronavirus deaths in nursing homes. So we want the, the number of deaths that occurred on each day in each facility. Uh, what they've given us at this point are cumulative totals. And if we wanted to analyze the impact of different policies or practices or events, you need to see the timing of when the, sir the, vir the virus got worse and got better. So the DOH does have a deadline to release all of this data, but you said you're nervous about this. Now, in practice, the law gives officials space to postpone fulfilling FOIL requests, and sometimes that stretches out the process many months or even years, right? Oh, yeah, they, they commonly will defer responding to a FOIL request for months. In this case, they deferred until uh, March 22nd of this year. We started this request back in August. Um, but in the meantime, we filed a lawsuit, and, the, and that took a certain number of months to unfold. And then last week, the court ruled entirely in our favor, and that's what that's really forcing the health department to respond. Now, in the time you guys have been fighting to get this information, New York's had a whole second wave. Do you think things could have been different? Well, when I asked about this data back in August, that was kind of the low point of our pandemic. Things had really calmed down. The infection and positivity rates were way down. The death rates were way down. Uh, since that time, as you point out, we've had another wave. And this wave hit a different part of the state primarily. It hit uh, mostly upstate. Uh, but it was, again, it was, once again, it was really bad in nursing homes. And I have to think that if we had had a better idea of how bad it got in nursing homes the first time, we might have been better prepared for the second wave. It's hard to know. Now, the Department of Health has maintained that New York's nursing home deaths rank well below the national average, but you guys found that the new total is nearly 15,000 deaths. That moves them up quite a bit, right? Yes. Uh, I never thought that the comparisons they were making to other states were appropriate because we knew they were leaving out a large share of the deaths in those comparisons. Uh, but now we know that the, the total uh, in nursing homes has gotten about 50% worse than it was. And uh, so that I think that puts a whole different light on it. First of all, it moves us well above the national average. Just we're, not, we're not necessarily the worst hit state in terms of our nursing homes, but we're certainly above average and it's nothing to brag about. All right, Bill Hammond from the Empire Center, thank you for your hard work and we'll be checking back in with you again soon. Thank you for having me. Churches in California are now free to open their doors after a Supreme Court ruling lifted a ban on indoor services during the pandemic. The justice is ruling in two cases that while the Golden State can't ban indoor services, they can limit attendance to 25% and restrict singing inside. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles advised parishes who return to indoor worship to follow those rules while also requiring social distancing and face masks. No matter the circumstances, people of faith were excited to return to the pews. 
Milwaukee. It's going to be amazing to go back and be a part of a community again. It's exciting to get back into church again. And I have to go in now and get myself a place to sit. That church, St. Robert's in Sacramento, also said they would be live streaming their services for those not ready to physically return to Mass. Still to come on Currents News, solidarity with the sick, how Somos community care doctors are serving their most needy patients and tackling the coronavirus pandemic head on. And then some friendly wagers on Super Bowl Sunday is benefiting local food pantries in the competing cities. We'll explain coming up. Serving in New York's underserved communities, one group of Catholic doctors is making sure everyone, regardless of their status, is fully inoculated against COVID-19. And as Claudia Torres reports, they believe their efforts were foretold by the Pope himself. In September 2019, Pope Francis met with a network of doctors who provide health care to ethnic minorities in New York. Esta solidaridad con los enfermos es un verdadero tesoro y es un signo distintivo del cuidado y la asistencia sanitaria auténtica que ponen en el centro de la persona y sus necesidades. The Somos Community Care Doctors never suspected that they would be faced with the biggest challenge of our time, the coronavirus pandemic. Yo creo que fue profético. I think our meeting with Pope Francis in September 2019 was prophetic, his message telling us what we had to do with the poor in New York, and I don't think we've let him down. We haven't failed him. Dr. Ramon Tayaj is the founder of this network of family physicians, who are from the same cultural communities as their patients, and who treat them in the language most familiar to them. Now they're administering vaccines to guarantee an equitable distribution. They've set up a vaccination centers in schools, churches, and synagogues throughout New York to make people feel more comfortable. The vaccine is more important than the disease. If you don't want the vaccine, the virus will get to you sooner or later. This group of doctors was one of the first to take action when the pandemic broke out, and it has remained one of the most active. In Rome, Claudia Torres, Currents News. Continuing the mission of charity, unity, and fraternity, the Knights of Columbus elected Patrick Kelly as the next Supreme Knight. Kelly, a retired U.S. Navy chap captain, will begin his term as the organization's 14th Supreme Knight on March 1st. He is succeeding Supreme Knight Carl Anderson, who has led the Knights of Columbus for more than two decades. Anderson will retire at the end of February after turning 70 years old, the organization's mandatory retirement age. Finally, the Lombardi Trophy wasn't the only thing up for grabs during Sunday's big game. Bishop Gregory Parks of St. Petersburg, Florida, and Bishop James Johnson Jr. of Kansas City, Missouri put food on the line. And now that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers beat out the Kansas City Chiefs, St. Elizabeth Catholic School in Missouri will send over barbecue for St. Paul's Food Drive in Florida. I guess you could call that a win-win. And that is Currents News. I'm Emily Druby. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.